My name is Christian Ashley, a seminary student and servant of God, and you are listening to the Let Nothing Move You podcast, a proud Anazal Ministries podcast. Welcome back to the Let Nothing Move You podcast. I'm your host, Christian Ashley, and I do need to make a minor, well, I should say a real big apology uh, for episodes 33 and 30, uh, excuse me, episode with Genesis 33 and 34. I originally uploaded the wrong file. I uploaded the raw uh, footage, which I only realized when I started listening to it several hours after it had released. So for those of you, that was your first introduction to that one. I apologize. Uh, That was my bad. I just downloaded the wrong link. It's not a Joshua problem. That was definitely a me issue. So there's that. So sorry for that. But with all that in mind, uh, do want to shout out another podcast here. We, you've heard about them before. It's my seminary life. Uh, I don't know exactly when, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I will be on an episode soon there for my seminary life where I, Brandon Knight, the host there, and Joe Day, the host of Buddy Walk with Jesus podcast, will all be discussing. Uh, he's doing an apologetics month, and one thing that was brought up in there is how our interpretations of creation matter, or some would argue, and I would be somewhat with them, uh, don't matter when it comes to apologetics as in reaching out to people versus, you know, defending the faith. So that was a really fun episode. It was a really long one, too, because uh, you get three people who really like to talk together. <laughs> and imagine that. They keep talking. So that's that. Uh, when that actually releases, I'll be sure to like send you guys that way because send some Brandon some love. And send Joe some love as well. He does some really good work over there at Buddy Walk. You know, hey, imagine this. I don't agree with everything he says. You know, it's like I, I'm me and other people are them. It's real funny like that. So with nothing further ado, we're going to get into this bad boy. We're going into Genesis 37 and 38 today, starting with verses 1 through 4. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was returning, the, was past, pasturing the flock, sorry, with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. So starting off here, we're introduced to who will be our new protagonist of Genesis until the very end of the book, really. Even though in some ways Jacob and Joseph do share that role at times. Joseph, as far as his brothers are concerned here, we're not entirely sure If the report he gave on his brothers was one made out of truth or one deliberately done to spread discord and mischief, I, given the general actions of his brothers in later verses, I lean more to them being in the wrong and being angry at him for being so self-righteous. Like, guys, you shouldn't be acting like this. And they're angry at him for being so pampered. So I kind of take Joseph's side on this. But once again, there's no like clear cut definition as far as I have read that explains one way or the other. So what this does is help create a divide that already existed, makes it even longer. That was already large enough as it was because of Jacob's blatant favoritism towards Joseph. Being the son of Rachel, he kind of liked them more. But that does not make their anger against him or their sins that were reported on right. No one in this situation acts perfectly, and we can learn from all of them on how to better act ourselves. Now, going to Jacob, his favoritism, like I said, continues to that present time, showing how he he favors Jake, uh, excuse me, Joseph more than his other brothers, his older brothers, outside of Benjamin, who we'll get to him later on. Uh, like I said earlier, being Rachel's child helped immensely with this, as she was the one woman that he had desired before ending up in the quagmire of a multiple marriage he had with his three other wives. Now, Jacob's gift of the robe of many colors was even further proof of this, as it was more than likely very incredibly expensive to make, given that dyes were harder to come by in Canaan then, and would be even more expensive if purple was one of the colors it had, as purple dye from Phoenicia could only be acquired by the truly rich. That's one of the things they had there, the, the Tyrian purple. 
they had these special little um, mollusks. Yeah, I think mollusks. I'll call them that. And if someone can always correct me along the way, that if you grinded them up, it would create a purple dye that people would use in clothes. And since that was one of the only places where you could do that, they made a killing off of it. So they could charge whatever rates they wanted because if people wanted to show that they were rich, they would wear purple clothing. Now, that's if purple is included among them. But either way, given that he is a shepherd removed from society, or at least as removed as Jacob will allow himself to be, it shows and that he's able to own a coat of this many colors, just how extravagant and rich he actually is compared to the people around him and compared to his brothers who don't seem to have received the same kind of favors and gifts and presents that Joseph did. Now, uh, there may also be an intention here shown in the original Hebrew that meant that the robe went down to cover his wrists, uh, his wrists and ankles rather than the regular lower, lower cut working robes, showing that Jacob didn't expect Joseph to work with his hands like his brother and expected him to live in a lap of luxury instead. There's kind of one of those insinuations there. We're not 100 percent sure. But if that is true, uh, if you were wearing robes back in the day to shepherd, you would want to be able to have your wrists and uh, legs ready to go and, hey, chase a sheep or beat a wolf over the head or a lion or what have you that was trying to take your sheep. If you were wearing robes like Joseph was, it meant that you were living in a way that you didn't have to work. Other people were working for you. You were better than them in that regard. But either way, the, ro the robe was an outward sign of the truth every older brother knew already in that they were seen as lesser in their father's eyes and Joseph was highly esteemed. And we go from there to verses five through 11. Now Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the excuse me, sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground, bef ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. To those of us who are older siblings, <laughs> passages like this kind of have a different meaning. I, I love all my siblings. But if one of them had dared to do and say the things that Joseph did, I get the initial reaction the brothers have. Their follow through, on the other hand, can't really get behind that. But what are you talking about? You don't know anything. You're younger than me. Is an okay initial reaction to have to this. But forgetting about what's going on here, forgetting that Joseph is indeed receiving prophetic dreams sent to him by God to inform him about the future, you kind of understand why it is so important that things happen this way. This is done to ensure that they happen, as God knew that Joseph was prideful and boastful enough to speak about them rather than keep them to himself or perhaps just speak of them in the presence of his father. A more tempered mind, a, more, a mind that had been better raised, I am saying that towards Jacob here, would have handled this situation a lot better. These are, prophe these are prophecies. These are things that are going to happen. There is no Greek prophecy here where they kind of maybe mess with it or you kind of misunderstood what was going on. There is no modern prophecy you see like, oh, it's really about this instead or we can prevent that from happening. No, a prophet from God will receive the absolute truth of what is to come. Now, it could be mired in imagery and stuff like that as it is here, but the meaning is quite plain. As soon as Joseph speaks it out to the rest of them, they're going to bow down to him. So instead of acting wise in this situation, which once again, he's 17, so I don't expect all of my great thinkers to be 17 years old. I don't expect them to be able to control their emotions because I know plenty of adults who can't even do that. So instead of acting rationally, he acts youthfully and impetuously, causing discord between his older brothers with the first dream and pretty much ensuring his eventual fate with the revelation of the second dream to the whole household. There was already an immense amount of bitterness 
and vitriol towards him coming from his older brothers. But these dreams, although true, only served to give them the impetus to enact their plan to get rid of him for good. These dreams were meant to show the future that God desired and was working to enact, but they didn't mean that those involved would be safe from harm in order for them to become reality. And as of you know Joseph's story, he is not guaranteed safety in the midst of this. Yeah, these things are going to happen, just not in the way we expect them to, not in the way they expected them to. Now, side note, uh, the mother here that Jacob mentions is either Leah, who would now be the top wife of his household, or if that's not the case, that means it places this chapter in a non-chronological order with Rachel still being alive before her death in 35. There's some debate with scholars. I tend to think – I tend to go with the, the Leah idea, but there's nothing guaranteeing that this is written in chronological order because, hey, that's more of a modern kind of thing for the most part and that we like our stories told. If you're going to be told in sequence, so you can have things in flashback – but you're going to make it sure people know it's a flashback. That's, like I said, a more modern uh, sensibility when it comes to how you write things creatively. So that's where I take it. Other people have taken it in other ways. You can have your own feelings on the matter. There you go. Now, Jacob's response to the dream, on the other hand, is filled with incredulity, revealing his own pride and how he can't imagine himself bowing down to his son. Joseph is immensely prideful in bringing these dreams that prop himself up above his family, but he learned that from the words and actions of his very prideful father. He was the golden child, the one who ne needed for nothing, who didn't do the work the other brothers were doing. So naturally, it meant that these dreams were supposed to be reality anyways, so why would anyone challenge them, as Jacob had already made it clear that Joseph was the best? Instructing your children in truth? means never teaching them your sinful inclinations and working with them to fight your mutual baser natures. People are imperfect. Parents are most definitely imperfect. My parents are not perfect. I've learned some really bad things from them. I've learned some really good things from them because sometimes you teach things unintentionally. Jacob in this scenario has definitely taught Joseph to be egotistical, to think himself above everyone else, to think that he is truly, might as well be a God among men. I don't, Joseph never says that out loud, but it might be something in his head, the way he's being treated. And Jacob, meanwhile, to his older brothers, has failed to teach them well, and with Joseph, and will fail again with Benjamin later on. Now, Benjamin, a little bit better than how Joseph turned out. He's a little meeker, a little nicer, and the brothers are nicer to him, get a little guilt of what happens later on. But Jacob is not father of the year. <laughs> He's not, not anywhere close. And we see that his parenting techniques leave a lot to be desired. And we'll see even more of that as we continue on. We'll be going into verses 12 through 28. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields and the man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they, pa where they are pasturing in the flock? And the man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will come, become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it? We kill our brother and conceal his blood. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, 
And they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Once again, Jacob has wandered away from the land of Bethel, where God wanted him, and allowed himself to get closer to the Canaanites by moving first to Hebron and sending his sons further north to Shechem to maintain their flocks. How he could ever think to send any member of his family up that way after what happened to Dinah and that city is baffling to me. But it simply shows just how easy it is to get back into older habits and how hard it is to deny yourself when an easier option is presented to you. And that's Jacob. He doesn't always think clearly, hey, Jacob's a human being just like the rest of us. I, I stand here thousands of years removed and like, how could you ever go there? But maybe it was just easier to send his flocks. You need to send your flocks somewhere where they can be fed, where it can be watered and be protected by people under your charge. And maybe, maybe Bethel wasn't working. Maybe God was directly working against him in that regard to see what he would do. We're not told. I'm speculating. Regardless, he should know better. And yet he chooses to do it anyways. And as far as Joseph is concerned in this situation, no doubt he made for an easier target to identify thanks to the robe of many colors that he wore, which only furthered their rage against him. You see them call him Dreamer in a mocking tone. Well, let's see what happens of his dreams if we just murder him right here. Who's going who's gonna to bow down before a dead guy? Can't imagine how that would happen. So upon seeing their brother in the, in the distance, the older brothers immediately devise a scheme to kill him. No doubt sensing the perfect opportunity to get away with it as there would be no witnesses in the wilderness to the crime. Outside of the, that random dude that Joseph met, there's pretty, pretty much no one around them. So unless some traitors happen upon them on the murder scene, they're probably going to get away with it. Reuben, on the other hand, thankfully, proposes another plan. But I think we shouldn't be too quick to get on his side. Comparatively speaking, because as we should recall, he is the oldest child and should have talked down his brothers from harming Joseph at all. If he ever wanted to be respected as the oldest son, that would have been a good way to go about it. Even though he would have been outnumbered essentially nine to one, doesn't matter. He should have spoken up. He should have done more than what he did. Not only that, in my opinion, once again, opinion, I think his plan most likely is to have Joseph suffer for a bit. That way he gets a little bit of out of his system, and then he's going to go rescue him himself so that he could regain the favor he lost from his father for sleeping with one of his wives. That happened in one of the earlier chapters we spoke of. So I think Reuben's plan is, yeah, I kind of hate Joseph, uh, Joseph, Joseph too. Let him suffer for a little bit, but I'll bring him out. I'll be the one to rescue him. I'll bring him back to my dad and say, look, the rest of them, they, they wanted to murder him. Uh, I saved Je Joseph. Please look at me again, dad. Look at me, dad. So in the midst of all this, once again, we find no noble person to cheer for here. But the Bible isn't a fairy tale story where everyone always acts either perfectly good or perfectly evil. Rather, it shows us our truest selves who are just as capable of engaging in both right after being, excuse me, in, in both of these, after being involved with the other. Even if he's acting more nobly to spare Joseph's life, he still doesn't chastise his brothers for allowing their hearts to turn murderous because of petty personal slights. That has no place here. He is supposed to act as someone who is going to succeed his father. Even if he knows, even if it hasn't been said, but he kind of figures his birthright has gone from him. If he ever wants to look good again in his father's eyes, he should have stood up. Now he does stand up, but only halfway. And that's not good enough. So as this is going on, they're scheming, figuring out what to do with them. As Joseph approaches, none the wiser to their intent, the brothers reveal their cruel intentions before Joseph can even get a word in. And since they can't harm him physically, they take the symbolic source of their anger in the robes and destroy them to let out their murderous passions. And then, after throwing him into the pit, they all have the gall to have something to eat, all while their brother is imperiled without food or water. Can you imagine that playing out? Uh, not only are we going to throw you into this pit, but you know, we're going to sit down, we're going to have some dinner. You know, we, we've worked hard today. I, I think we've earned it. <laughs> can you see the, the psychopathic tendencies that develop in someone's mind where they can do something so heinous and evil 
and just go back to their regular life like they just did nothing wrong. Now, most of us, I think all of us, have done similar things, not to say we've all thrown someone into a pit, but we've done some evil, despicable things, and we just went back to our life. Just like nothing happened. Like we didn't lie about that person and made them lose their job just so we could get somewhere higher. Or we talked about someone behind their back and said these awful, terrible things. And the next time we see them, we say, how's it going, buddy? You're my best friend, blah, blah, blah. And we act like we did nothing wrong. That's what they're doing here. Not only examples have to be extreme for the same point to remain. Any sin we commit against ourselves, against God, against others, and then we act like we did nothing wrong, well, guess who's in the wrong there? It's still us. It was still them in that moment in time. So we look over here and they see coming their way some Ishmaelite traders. There's some Midianite traders there as well. They're both relatives of the Jacob fa- of Jacob's family who came from Abraham, giving birth to multiple sons through his different wives and concubines, that they have now grown to the point where, just like the Edomites, they have established themselves as a group of people. They have an entire tribe. And when they the way they've grown resources is they started trading with other countries. So the Ishmaelites have grown enough into trading nomads that they have crossed from Canaan to Egypt, and they're making a pretty penny off of it. Now, one of the easiest trades to get into, unfortunately, at that time was the slave trade. And there was much profit to be made from it. Many times in scripture, we will see the evils of slavery and how it affects those under its bondage. In many ways, the brother's decision to sell Joseph into slavery is far more evil than their initial plan to murder him because this gives them the sadistic glee that he will suffer and never be able to see his family again as he's forced to live in a foreign land. You know, I've been angry at my brother before. I've been angry at my sisters before. Never to this point. Maybe in my head I thought, yeah, I'd just be better off if you were dead. But I always regretted it after. Never once did I truly mean it. To think that you could do this to your sibling, no matter how in your mind you think they're just self-righteous, it's just acting like they're better than you, kills me as a brother. And it gets even worse. Imagine that. Judah's plan to sell Joseph into slavery reveals his evil heart. And we're going to see more in chapter 38. But unlike his three older brothers, this isn't enough for him to lose his birthright. Because I think along the way, we see a repentant Judah, and God acknowledges that. I don't think think we see the same for Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. You could argue for Reuben a bit, and I would be along there for the ride with you, but I think Judah is really the only one who actually repents. Now, some may argue that this makes God contradictory in how he deals with people, but let us recall that God alone can make the calls on how the world should work. And as he tells Moses in Exodus 33, 19, B, in the NIV, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Those of us of who've been with me since we've uh, discussed Romans together will know Paul quotes that verse. When it comes to the idea of you know predestination, free will, in that argument, that's one of the things he brings up. God is the ultimate judge. God shows Jacob over Esau, because God also saw that Jacob would be the one to actually ask for repentance. Jacob would actually be the one for all his many faults to serve God. And let us look at Jacob's brothers. Not a single one of them deserved to have their birthright. By the culture of the time, it should have been Reuben. And the father had the right to take it away if something like what happened with Reuben happened in that situation. So it should have gone to Simeon and Levi. But they lost theirs as well. So there's an argument to be made. If Jacob had known about this, he would have taken it from Judah, but he didn't, not until much later. But also remember, Jacob didn't deserve the birthright. He stole it. He stole something, one of the most important things in the world, from his brother, taking advantage of him. And it steals the blessing later on, too. Does that sound like a righteous man of God? Oh, wait, it doesn't. Yet he becomes one. Yet God had compassion on Jacob, on Judah, and allowed the birthright to pass down to one of his sons. And from Judah, we'll see how that happens as well. As God knew, no human being would ever be worthy of it based on God's standards, because we all fall short. There's never been a perfect man outside of Jesus Christ in this world. There's never been a perfect woman. God had compassion on those he had compassion on. And we should be grateful that he has any compassion and mercy at all, because he could just as easily take it away. 
Now, the 20 shekels of, shil- of sil- shilver, silver may not be 30 pieces of silver, but the comparisons between the jo- uh, betrayal of Joseph and Jesus are pretty much palpable here. If you know what palpable means, you can almost touch it or you can feel it. Joseph, in some respects, serves as an early Christ figure in how he suffers and is able to rise to power once more. And we'll see a little more of those threads along the way. Obviously, this is not a perfect parallel. As Jesus was sinless and Joseph has proven himself to be very prideful, but there is enough for us to see the similarities there. I'm going to finish off this chapter and go into 38 after this by going to verses 29 through 36. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in, of many colors, excuse me, and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down the shield to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Now, as much as I talked smack about Reuben earlier, I believe his reaction here is genuine, at least initially. But one that I would argue is also motivated mostly by his desire to be restored to his former position. But I would never say that he has no feelings of love towards Joseph. His scheme has failed because he failed to act as the older brother should have and completely curb the baser instincts of his younger brothers. Instead of admitting the truth, As, hey, he has just become a part of this conspiracy, he agrees to join them and pretends that Joseph was murdered by a wild animal, further staining the hated robe of many colors in order to do so. There exists a world out there where Reuben takes the blame for this, stands up and says, it's my fault. Or he acts against his brothers and calls them out for their evil. But that's not our world. Here, Reuben becomes a co-conspirator. Yeah, he didn't sell Joseph into slavery, but he might as well have because he's profiting off of it. And the depravity of Joseph's brothers is shown further here and that they make their father identify the robe, knowing full well who it belongs to, and take further sadistic glee at seeing their father's despair, even pretending to comfort him while they laugh at behind his back at the fact that they got away with the crime. <laughs> Can you imagine something more evil? To do that to a family member and then to lie about it to your father and make up this story about how he was and have the father even be the one to say your lie in front of you without you prodding him on. You just showed us, oh, you found this robe, man. Is it Joseph's? And then Jacob's the one who announces their plan without even realizing it, that he's fooled into thinking that it's a wild animal. The deceiver has been deceived once again. Now, side note, the mention of daughters here shows that Jacob either had more daughters than Dinah, who never really get brought up before now, or maybe even later. I don't, I can't remember if this ever gets brought up again. Or either refers to granddaughters had by his sons. Like, regardless, the daughters, at least, seem to not be culpable in the crimes their brothers committed and are indeed there for their father in his time of mourning, in their shared time of mourning. And to show just how much they are mourning. Reuben initially does this, but then loses it along the way. But Jacob tears his garments, puts a sackcloth on his loins, and mourn for his son many days. This is evil, what is happening to this man. But he takes it the extra mile, the wrong extra mile. Normally, that's a good thing. Here, it's a really bad thing. His response to mourn is both appropriate and not at the same time. He has thought he has lost his most beloved son. I don't want to be in the room with the man and giving him that information. I can't imagine what you would go through hearing that news and thinking that this was reality. To lose his favored son no doubt breaks Jacob even further, but he allows that grief to cloud his judgment, choosing to believe the story told to him by his sons and the one that he made up on his own, 
rather than independently verify their claims. But if they found the robes, where was it at? Where was the body? Where was the animals that did this? What's going on? Clearer heads might have been able to ask those questions and poke holes in the story. Now, I am saying this thousands of years removed from the context. It is easy for me to say that not in the midst of this grief. I admit that fully. So he shouldn't be too harsh on him in the midst of grief. But Jacob, once again, allows that grief to control him rather than working through the process in a healthier fashion, which, by the way, could have been handled by him going directly to God. Now, it's not told if he did so, but given that God is kind of silent on this without being reached out to, uh, number one, I think God is doing that because it would have messed with his plans if that were to happen. But two, I don't think Jacob actually asked. So, of course, God would not reveal that to him. So he could have sought God for his counsel. And, hey, that might have even revealed the deception earlier. And maybe the story would have changed. Maybe God would have done it through some other means. But this leaves Jacob in such a sorry state. And as stated before several times, like on other episodes, grief is natural and good for a time as it reveals our truest love for those we lost. But to remain there in that grief is neither natural or good for the heart, especially for those of us who have hope in the resurrection. Now, there's an argument to be made. I'm fairly certain they weren't his. And as someone who doesn't believe in universalism, that hurts. Knowing there was an opportunity for that person to come to faith, and it's never going to happen, no matter how many years we live from here on out. That hurts. That burns. But it's also outside of our control. There's only so much we can do for that person. They're the ones ultimately who made the wrong call. That doesn't make the loss any better, but it helps us understand. Now, Joseph, meanwhile, uh, has no news on his family and won't for many years, being sold into slavery into the house of Potiphar, who will, for the most part, will find, be a decent master to him. But we'll cover that later. But these actions here born of one scheme of hatred and bitterness and resentment, have created a domino effect that will bring God's glory into the world in ways no one could have expected and rise Joseph to power in accordance to the dreams he had, but once again, done in such a way that he never would have expected. That is the power of this story. It is a beautiful story at the end of the day, but it takes a lot of hurt to get there. So moving from there, we'll go to verses uh, 1 and 11 of chapter 38. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shalah. Judah was in Chezeb when she bore him, father of the year. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go to your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. So we have here a chapter. You oftentimes don't hear preached on Sunday. I'm My best guess, and I think my best reality, would be because of the sexual content within it. I don't really see too many people bringing up Genesis 34 either. Although that one deals more with the salt than this one does with the sexual themes in different ways. And I think people just get squicked out by it. They just can't handle it. They want to go, mm, I don't know about that. Uh, why is that in my Bible? And then they just turn a page to 39 and move on with Joseph's story. But to do so is to our detriment. To do so is to lose something important that is happening here. Many important things that are happening, not only in Judah's life, but tomorrow's life and for the future of the world and the hope that we live in, if these things do not happen, we do not have Jesus Christ in the way that we do. God would have used some other means. Obviously, it's his plan. It's his goal. But if these things don't happen, if we just overlook them, we are missing why God thought it was important to include this here. Because guess what? There is no chapter about what Dan and Issachar are up to, or Zebulun, or Asher, or what have you. There is a chapter devoted to Judah 
to talk about his evil, his sin, and what he learns from that experience that will have repercussions for the entire world. So if you're upset about the subject matter here, I don't blame you. But at a certain point, there's time to grow up. I don't like what happens here, but I know how important it is because I took the time to read it. I took the time to explore it. You don't have to be happy about certain things in this chapter. Just like you don't have to be happy about things that happened in 34. But we need to read it regardless. Because this is here for our benefit. These actual historical events that we need to look at into deeply because God chose for Moses to write these down for the Jews' benefit and for our benefit. So with all that in mind, Judah's actions in this chapter show him starting off in a poor place, even forgetting if we forget what he did to Joseph. Let's pretend that didn't happen for a second. But they also portray a man lost to sexual lust who learns how to make up for the sins of the past. This is, in some ways, a redemption story, at least the start of one. And it makes what happens later on in Genesis that much more effective because he's taken time to grow. He did not remain static. He did not remain the same person who called for his brother to be sold into slavery or who would have treated Tamar the same way he does at the start of this chapter. But even with that in mind, he has failed his family by marrying a Canaanite woman and in how he treats sex as casually as he does. Unlike his father, Judah and neither of his brothers seem to have intermarried with their relatives in the north. We don't know that for a a whole fact. Maybe that happens later on, but I think it doesn't. And one of the reasons I don't is because I'm pretty sure Jacob just didn't want to deal with people who had swindled him in the past and would probably do it again. Uh, He probably doesn't want to deal with Laban's sons because they've already treated him poorly before. And he thought that they would probably do the same to his children. Regardless, Jacob didn't do a good enough job in teaching his children who to seek out in a wife and how to love them. We don't really see perfect husbands here. Uh, Jacob, not really the best of the best either. You would think that maybe at this point in time, at this late in marriage, he would have figured out "Mm, between these four women, I should probably treat them better. I should be a better example to my sons. But that doesn't happen. Not as much as we would like it to. So the sons, no doubt learning, from the actions of their father's example, that they could do whatever they wanted and marry whoever they wanted, rather than seeking wives that would work alongside them, decide to do what they've been told not to do, and at least in Judah's case, intermarry with Canaanites. Now, please note, God does not hate the Canaanites or intermarriage with them because he is racist against them. Anyone who says that is an idiot who doesn't understand scripture. Rather, God has seen the wickedness of the Canaanite culture and doesn't want his chosen people to emulate them. He doesn't want them sacrificing their children to Molech. He doesn't want them practicing these evil sexual deviant acts. He doesn't want them to treat other people as if they're just property, as if they just, if we conquer you, then we can do whatever they want to you. We can do whatever we want to you. Even still, despite all this, God will allow the Canaanite line to continue in some fashion due to Tamar being an ancestor of Jesus. And guess what? The entire tribe of Judah, most of the tribe of Judah, sorry, most of the tribe of Judah, sorry, I got my genealogies mixed up there. Can't imagine why I would ever do that with all the names that kind of run together. Can be traced from this union. So that means there is no such thing as pure Jewish blood. And the same thing is there's no such thing as pure blood of anyone. We're all a bunch of misfits. We're all a bunch of mutts, and that's good. That's okay. There are tribes that exist in my blood whose names I'll probably never know because they all got wiped out a pile ago. So God, even desiring the destruction of the Canaanites, allows this to happen here because God does not hate them because of their race. He doesn't hate them because of their blood. He hates them because of their actions. And yet he allows Jesus Christ to come from this line, from these same people who are going to be wiped out. And guess what? There's one more in there. We're going to get the Rahab forever from now in Joshua. So there's multiple Canaanite lineages within the bloodline that leads to Jesus. And it's probably some of them alive today who came from Jesus's other brothers and sisters. And we just don't have the genealogical records because Jesus himself didn't have children. That means Canaanites no longer exist as a thing as far as are represented by people within this world. 
Samaritans might be your best case. And even then, probably not. And yet, they have a legacy. They have a story to be told in the history of the gospel, in the history of bringing people together. It starts here. Parts of it start here. God bringing together people you would never think belong among his fold into the fold. And Jesus' genealogy, as we continue looking on through history and scripture, they are, it is filled with people of various nations and of those who, have been, who offered great good and great evil in the world. God was sovereign over this process, and his will was done in the end, despite and because of human actions. Now, going on to Ur, his specific sins are unknown as far as I'm aware. There's really nothing that goes into further commentary that I have seen in Scripture. Uh, I know there's some rabbinical texts that kind of look into this more, but that's more guesswork than actually, yes, yeah, sure, we know for sure. But God's judgment upon him is no doubt just. God doesn't just decide where you're going to die. There are reasons behind it. Perhaps had Ur lived, even more evil actions would have been committed and God killed him to prevent those from happening. Or he knew, or excuse me, or because he knew, because he did know what would happen between Judah and Tamar later on in this chapter, he just devised things to bring about what should happen as a part of his plan. Regardless, Ur and Onan showed that they either never listened to their father's counsel or that Judah was just as bad as a father as he was as a husband and needed to learn how to be a better man. I kind of lean towards the latter one at this point in his life. Now we go to Onan on the other hand, and we see proof of his sinful nature by denying his brother the right to continue his family line as was the custom at the time. The idea was for the next brother in line to marry the widow, even if they themselves were married for the most part. You could sometimes get away with saying no if there was someone else who could take uh, the woman to be the wife and you were already married but it was kind of frowned upon. So this provided that widow with a home and a way to prevent her from finding illicit means in order to provide for herself. It wasn't a good place for women back in the day without a husband, without a son to watch over you. Hate to say it, but that's history. That's true. And this was a law, a custom put in place. We'll see more in later scripture about why this becomes a thing. But to sum it up, it's to find a way to provide for her after a husband dies. And this also, if she has no children of her own, provides that husband who died with someone to live on in their lineage. Look, they knew, everyone present knew that physically that child wasn't the brother's kid. But legally, that child was the first brother's. And the second son that came from that union would be the second brother's first child. This prevented entire lines from being wiped out and for family legacies to continue. And as people, that was all they had on this earth was their legacy. And you always thought about that. This was super important to them. For Onan not to engage in this was a smack in the face to culture, tradition, and showed that he never loved his brother as he should, nor did he love Tamar as he should. Now, scholars have debated for years on what precisely he did to earn God's wrath so that he could never have a son for his brother. They range from you know, him just pulling out or never entering or masturbating. The most likely case is that he was using Tamar for his own sexual gratification and pulling out before this could result in a child that would not be his. Now, as we know now, this isn't a foolproof method of preventing pregnancy, but we can only say that because of the knowledge we have today. So to Onan, this was a willful desire to engage in sin and never honor his family or God as sex is meant to do. Thus, God kills him too for his evil. Now, Judah, rather than admit his fault as a parent and a man, decides instead that Tamar is the one to blame and lies to her that he will give her to her his third son, Shelah, while intending to never do so as he sees her as the problem who caused the death of his sons. He couldn't possibly be the man. It couldn't possibly be me for being a bad father that my sons ended up these sinful wretches. No, 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 no. Not to say that just being a godly parent means you're obviously going to have godly children. That still happens. But judging from the actions of Judah here, I don't see a godly parent. Now, not only was this evil to begin with, but this made Tamar a pariah among her own people, who no doubt saw her as an omen of death and would never provide or care for her outside of her own family, who are going to die later on, statistically speaking, 
and leave her alone without a husband or son to take care of her. This was a terrible place to be as a woman. So Judah knows this is going to happen and acts in evil and sin anyways, because he can't admit that he was wrong. He can't admit that his sons were evil. Now we'll go from there to verses 12 through 23. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers. He and his friend, he read the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah so, to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Eniam, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge until you said it, until you send it, he said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend the Adulamite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, Where is the cult prostitute who was at Aniam at the roadside? And they said, No cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also the men of the place said, No cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, Let her keep the things as her own, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. Now, Tamar's ingenuity here to ensure her safety as a woman and to carry on her previous husband's legacy is not inherently wrong in that she was supposed to be taken care of by Judah, and he had failed to love his daughter-in-law as was required. However, the way she went about it was also sinful. Neither party here involved is righteous. But God still uses the sins of men and women to bring his glory into the world. Tamar would gain the children and supporters she needed for her own protection and legacy. And Judah would see and be confronted by his own sin, which helped his heart change over time. By the culture of the time, Tamar couldn't remarry outside of Judah's family because she needed to give sons to the two husbands who died. So she needed to marry Shelah. But he had left her in such a desperate state that made her react impulsively to ensure her future safety. Judah, meanwhile, was in the midst of mourning his own wife and, rather than dealing with that grief in a healthy fashion, deciding, decides to engage in his lust with what he assumed to be a temple prostitute, a woman whose job it was to collect money for the pagan temples through prostitution. It's another form of sexual slavery that was used back in the day. There'll be people out there that say, oh, it was a, it was a noble profession. It's like, no. It was evil then. It was a controlling way of using women to entice them to give money to false gods. It's a grand evil, and he willingly participated in that practice. Her face was also veiled, so Judah didn't recognize her by sight, but showed just how poorly he knew his daughter-in-law at all, and that he never recognized her voice or physical features while he willingly engaged in sin. Now, Tamar's craftiness ensures that she will not be punished for her sins in the culture, in that she asks for items personally belonging to Judah that will prove who the father of her children are and force him to take care of her and them. That is a smart plan. It's not a noble plan, but it is a smart plan. Judah's short-sightedness once again causes him trouble, but God remains sovereign through it all, causing their sin to be used for his ultimate glory in that the line will continue and the Messiah will come from their union. This could have just been some random events plot. that just kind of happened, people giving in a sin, but God doesn't let it remain there. He brings a purpose to this union. He brings a purpose to this situation. 24 through 30. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom... These belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Shelah, and he did not know her again. 
When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez, which means breach. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Now, Judah's hypocrisy here is almost comical. Not three months ago, and who knows how many times since then, he had done the exact same thing that he's crusading against. Part of this was the inherent misogyny of the culture. But the vast majority of what is to blame here is his own inability to curb his sinful nature, whether it be through sex or whether it be through pride and not taking care of someone he was supposed to be taking care of. Now, oftentimes, there will be preachers, priests, uh, small group leaders, youth pastors, so on and so forth, who will decry evil in the world only for them to fall into it themselves. Sometimes this happens because they too wish to engage in that evil, but crusade against it because they want to look like they're not affected by these sins. They want to look like they're holy. They say, I could never be tempted by that. The shame on the people who are. I'm so better than them. Now, hypocrisy is something every human being engages in. But the Christian, pastor, leader or not, should be warier about this as we work for God and are his representatives in this world. The world will always engage in sin. So when we, who claim that we are not part of it and don't believe what they do, then do the exact same thing that we are against doing and that they are actively doing, they then rightfully can call us out, which makes an already difficult job in reaching them even harder. Say, oh, well, God didn't really change you. You're doing the exact same things I'm doing. Why would I want to serve God if you can't even control yourself? Now, that's an excuse. It's a bad excuse. But it's a bad excuse that's made easier for them to say because of the actions of Christians. And Christians shouldn't pretend like this is some odd phenomenon that just happens every now and then. <laughs> this is something that happens all the time because pastors, leaders, what have you, are human beings. That doesn't make what they do right. That doesn't mean we just, you know, oh man, you slipped up this one time and we're going to we're going to let it slide and we'll just hide it, we'll cover it up. No. That means we call it out when it happens. We rehabilitate those who are willing to repent. If they're not willing to repent, they're out. No leader should be in charge who is actively engaging in sin and has no remorse for it. Judah, to his credit, when called out for his hypocrisy, admits publicly to his fault and even declares Tamar more righteous than he in this scenario. That still doesn't make him father of the year material or man of the year material, but it is a step in the right direction. He also doesn't take further advantage of her, as most men of the day would have had, and stops their sexual relationship, knowing it would only bring both of them further harm. And in so doing, since there are twins here, there's a child for Ern, there's a child for Onan, but legally, they're going to be his as far as birthright is considered because of how this is handled. Now, the story of the birth of Perez and Zerah is one of God subverting expectations and messing with people in a very fun way. Zerah is perceived as the one who will receive the birthright, but Perez manages to leave his mother first, ensuring that he will be the one that it passes to. Perez will be the one through whom Jesus' lineage is continued. Now, as far as the legal standards are handled, he would have been Ur's son. But as far as geneal genealogies are concerned, it's going to be Judah most people are going to bring up. I don't, I don't think any of the genealogies we see of Jesus mentions Ur, or even of David. They're probably just going to say Judah. So they knew physically this is Judah's son. His line is going to continue this way. So there you go. Two difficult stories, but ones we need to read. Ones that are massively important for us to understand. So thank you all for listening. Please, you get a choice. Leave a uh, uh, get a chance. A chance, not a choice. I'm giving you a choice, but you have a chance. 
Leave a five-star review on your podcasting platform of choice just to help us with the ratings there to find more people. If you're interested in my own fiction writing, you can find my work at StarvingWritersGuild.com or on Amazon by searching for the name MC Ashley. If you're all interested in some further solid studies into the Bible and its teachings, then check out the other members of the Anazel Ministries Podcasting Network. You can contact me at LetNothingMoveYouPodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to expend a special thank you to Joshua Knoll for the editing that he does and for the music he has to the podcast. And with all that in mind, God bless you in accordance to His will and not mine. And allow me one more time to remind you, let nothing move you. Hey guys, are you interested in podcasting but don't know where to go? Well, check out Zencaster.com and go ahead and make an account there and use special promo code Let Nothing Move You, all caps. That way you can get 30% off of your next deal to go ahead and set things up so you can figure out how to edit stuff using Zencaster.com to host your stuff to get things done there. So check out Zencaster.com, use special promo code Let Nothing Move You. All right, see ya.